Anna Hoffman, and welcome to this episode of Data Exposed Live. It's been a long time, or at least it feels like it's been a long time since we've all been live, but that was really just because last month we were in person at SQL Bits in London. Uh, but without further ado, I want to get right into it. We're going to be talking about the Azure SQL news updates and we have a lot of special guests on the show it's gonna be a packed show as always uh if you're streaming in from wherever you're streaming in from i want you to remember that we do take live questions so be sure to put your questions in the chat whether you're on learn tv twitter twitch youtube through the reactor or some other way that you're streaming this uh we are getting all those questions and uh we can feature some of them as they come in and display them kind of like this. So go ahead and engage with us. Let us know how things are going. Let us know what you think of the news. Um, we are here to engage uh, you all. So that all being said, I think we can get right in to some product updates. And there's been a lot of updates this month, actually a lot of updates that happened at the beginning of March. So I'm gonna encourage everyone to uh, go ahead and take a look at the news update from last month, because it has a lot of the like early month updates uh, and launches that happened at Microsoft SQL Bits, which you don't wanna miss. Uh, but to name just a few that landed in the later half, or I happened to announce early and the official announcement came later, uh, we can talk about some of those updates. The first in Azure SQL Managed Instance is the link feature and the link capability. This has been a big one. It's been really popular among the community and among our customers. And the idea here is that you can essentially link a SQL server running anywhere to an Azure SQL Managed Instance running in Azure. And uh, you can use it for disaster recovery. And we've got a couple of really great demos that I don't have any of them ready today, uh, but we will share a link to some demos in the blog if you wanna check this out. And let's see, what else launched? So another thing that launched was advanced maintenance notifications. We'll talk a little bit more about this. Uh, this became generally available uh, or in, I'll have to think about that. Uh, it's in the blog. So, uh, but we'll talk a little bit about what advanced ma maintenance notifications are a little bit later in the episode when we talk about blogs. Uh, in preview, we also announced service broker message exchange with any SQL server and managed instance. So this is uh, a pretty interesting one where you can essentially uh, do this messaging exchange between an Azure SQL managed instance in Azure, of course, uh, and a SQL server maybe on-prem in a virtual machine in another cloud, doesn't matter. Uh, and then another big update that happened just last week uh, was that we enabled Windows authentication for Azure SQL Managed Instance AAD principles, uh, again, in public preview. And essentially what this enables you to do is allow customers uh, to move existing services to the cloud while kind of maintaining that seamless user experience because we're able to kind of translate those uh, Windows authentication to the AAD principles. Uh, another thing I would just call out, because uh, I might not have mentioned it yet in this episode, and that is that we typically have a lot of news that comes out in here, and you might be wondering, like, okay, like, Anna shared so much with me, how do I stay up to date? Uh, all of this should be published live in a blog now uh, with all of the information and links to learn more. So don't feel like if I'm moving too fast, you will have a place to go deeper. All right, so let's get back into some of the updates for Azure SQL Database. Uh, one was import and export with private endpoints. Again, we'll talk a little bit later about this in the blog section, and same for monitoring the database restore progress uh, at a more granular level. This one's really interesting. There's also a couple other things that kind of come out through the blogs as less formal announcements than here, so you'll definitely want to stay tuned. Then the last thing I wanted to mention is the Azure SQL Migration Extension Azure Data Studio with support for the Azure PowerShell uh, commandlets, as well as the Azure CLI. Uh, we actually recorded a really exciting episode about this the other day, so you'll have to stay tuned for a full episode on that. Um, now, starting in 2022, we actually started including the news for other database services. So here you just see kind of a highlight reel of what's going on in the rest of the database services space. If we start with Cosmos DB, uh, of course, the big one was the always encrypted uh, general availability for Azure Cosmos DB. Um, and the other one that I found really interesting was the Azure Cosmos DB partition key advisor notebook. So this is something they essentially launched on GitHub. So it's open source and you can just kind of fork the notebook and download it. Uh, and it basically is going to give you advice 
on how to understand, you know, the best practices around your partition keys uh, that you have today. And also like a good learning exercise if you're not exactly sure how it should be set up in your Cosmos DB accounts. Uh, moving on to our open source databases, you probably all know we have uh, open source databases for Postgres, for MySQL, and for MariaDB. Uh, some of the things that happen in the Postgres space, at least for a flexible server, include uh, some of the new extensions like the timescale DB, which basically allows you to have time series functionality on top of Postgres. Uh, we also added the Orifice package. I could be pronouncing that wrong, but we added that to Azure Database for Postgres Flexible Server, which basically allows you to get more functionality and operators. Uh, this can also help if you're moving from, say, Oracle to uh, Postgres. So that's something cool to check out. And then finally, another extension we saw was PG Repack. And this allows you to remove bloat from your tables uh, and indexes. And optionally, you can restore to restore the physical order of your clustered indexes. So some interesting things to keep keep an eye out for. You'll also notice across Postgres and MySQL, there were a bunch of new regions uh, that became available, as well as some things related to compliance. Uh, so those are some things you might want to check more into if you're using Postgres today. Um, and all that being said, you know, like I said, we we're doing a lot more Postgres these days, we're doing a lot more uh, MySQL, MariaDB, and there's even this thing called Citus uh, that I thought I would bring up someone from the Citus team, actually, uh, Claire, to tell us a little bit more about Postgres, Citus, and some things happening in the community. So Claire, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. I, I This is probably my third time on the show, and I look forward to it every time, Anna. Big awesome. Fan. It's it's great to have you on the show as always. And uh, today we're gonna be talking, I think you're gonna help us understand a little bit more about Postgres and Citus and what's going on. And I think kind of the first question that I have and I think a lot of our viewers might have is, uh, what is Citus? Absolutely, um, that is a good place to start. Um, if we pop up, there you go, um, this slide. Here's a picture of the GitHub repo for the Citus extension to Postgres. So it's an extension. Um, people use it as a, almost a layer of software on top of Postgres. But when you're using Citus, you are also using the Postgres database. And um, it's been around for almost a decade now. Um, and engineers at Microsoft are the ones who nurture it and maintain it and um, keep evolving this technology forward. And then people use it both on Azure, right? Because Hyperscale Citus is part of Azure database for Postgres. Um, they use it on Azure. They also use Citus open source in order to scale out Postgres and shard Postgres. So that gives you all sorts of benefits of parallelization in terms of performance um, and just enables you to scale your application because you're no longer limited to the resources of a single node. Although gotcha. I should point out that um, as of, I think about a year ago now, you can also use Citus on a single node and um, that gets your data model all sharded from the very beginning. Um, so that it's so much easier to scale out when you need to. And you also get to use things like columnar on a single node with Citus too. So, so it's um, no longer just for, you know, big clusters and multi-node clusters too. Awesome. Cool. That yeah. seems like there's a lot of use cases for it, especially in this world of new SQL and distributed SQL and getting a lot of scale. So it's great to hear. Um, I understand there was recently a pretty big announcement in this space. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened? Um, there was. Um, basically, the beta for Citus 11.0 came out, and that was just a couple of weeks ago. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a screenshot of the blog post um, on the Citus open source blog that Marco Slot, who's the technical lead um, for Citus, he wrote it. And it dives you through um, kind of all the details of what's in 11.0 beta and why you might want to test drive it and how you can do so. Um, so I put a short URL on the screen, the aka.ms URL there in the green box um, that will take you straight to this blog post. Um, and uh, we hope people come and try it out. Obviously, uh, people who are already using Citus have already rolled up their sleeves and, and they've been trying it out. But even if you've never used Citus before, this should be an interesting read and maybe a good way to kind of get oriented. 
Awesome. So. Cool. This, this is going to be a great resource. I, I, I just can tell. Uh, so um, moving forward, I did want to ask you, like, I know you as well as the community, as well as a bunch of other folks have been coming together to uh, kind of run this event coming up soon called CytusCon. Um, and I'd love to ask you a little bit about like what it is and you know, also maybe a little bit more about like how much it relates to Citus versus Postgres versus the overlap. Okay, good questions. Um, yeah, I've been living, eating, and breathing CitusCon, an event for Postgres, um, for a couple of months now. Um, it's the very first ever um, of this event, and let me see. I put together a couple bullets that give you the highlights. Um, it's free. It's virtual. It's global. Um, it's happening next week, so April twelfth and thirteenth. And um, there are going to be three live streams, one in Americas, one in APAC, and one in EMEA, which stands for, you know, Europe and Middle East and Africa. Um, and each of those live streams is going to have six unique talks. But then there's also 20 more on-demand talks that have we my team is pre-recorded and those will be dropping um, at the very start of the conference, at the beginning of the very first um, live stream talk. And there's no registration. Um, you can find information using hashtag CitusCon on Twitter. Just search on that. And uh, we're just asking that people mark their calendars. We know how busy everyone is, but there's a lot of super useful content about Postgres and about Citus and Azure database for Postgres um, in this event. So I've got some more slides. I can dive through some more information if you want to know even more. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So I mentioned um, that it's about Postgres, it's about Citus, and it's about Azure Database for Postgres. Those are kind of the three different, uh, very much related um, technologies that this is about. And we're inviting and welcoming users of those technologies, as well as developers and people who work on them. So, so we've got a real mix in terms of the 42 speakers who were involved in the, the conference. And um, there's three keynoters that I really want to highlight as long as I'm here. Um, the keynoter for the Americas live stream is Andy Pavlo, who is a professor in the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, he, I think he self titles himself the professor of databaseology there. Uh, so he's re really well known in the database space. And he's going to be talking about the building blocks for self-driving Postgres. Um, which is, you know, a pretty interesting concept when you look to the future, because a lot of time is spent um, both on the part of cloud providers, right, who put together managed services or people who manage their own databases. There's a lot of time spent configuring, tuning, optimizing. And so the idea of self-driving databases is obviously holds a lot of appeal. Um, and then Umer Chibakchu. My former boss, he's the former co-founder and CEO of Citus Data, and he now works at Microsoft and heads up the PM team for Postgres, all things Postgres here, including Citus. And he's going to be talking about the eight keys to the growth of Citus and distributed Postgres. Um, so, and he is heading up the APAC live stream. So the time zones are all different here. So that APAC live stream, it says April 13th on the slide, 11 a.m. Singapore time. Um, so that's actually like my Tuesday evening. Um, and then the keynoter for the EMEA live stream is Magnus Agander, who's really famous in all circles Postgres. Um, he's a member of the Postgres core team and a leader in Postgres Europe. And he's going to be talking about the database and why he believes it's more relevant than ever. Um, and that time zone there is CEST, so Central European Summertime, 11 a.m. on Wednesday, April 13th. Um, and then there's more speakers in each of the live streams beyond the keynoters. So um, we'll have six talks in the Americas live stream. We'll have another six talks in the APAC live stream. And I'm one of them. Um, and I'm in really good company. There's some fascinating um, uh, presenters here. And then six more in the, the European live stream. Um, that's not all. <laughs> so I don't know how many more minutes I have left. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, of course, there's a code of conduct, even for virtual events, there's always a code of conduct. And just to be clear, um, this whole thing is brought to you by the Postgres and Citus team here at Microsoft Azure. And um, I just am immensely grateful for all my teammates, the people in the Learn TV team who are helping to produce and broadcast all these live streams, all the speakers, um, all the work they put in putting together like this super useful learning material and then the rest of the organizers and my co-chair, um, Teresa Giacomini, they've all been fantastic. So big, big props to everybody. 
Awesome. You know, Claire, there actually was one question. So this might be a good way to, to kind of wrap. Uh, from okay. Frank's world, first of all, they said, cool. Uh, but the second question was, will these be recorded and available on demand? So I think like if you miss the live stream, uh, what happens? Yes, everything's going to be recorded and available on demand. So there are like if I flip through here, you're going to see like six Citus customer talks. These some of these are in the live stream, uh, but some of them are pre-recorded. And so all the on demand talks are going to drop on YouTube and on docs.microsoft.com um, at the very start of the event. Um, here's four more Azure database for Postgres talks. Sunil Agarwal, um, you may have had him on the show before. He heads up um, the PM team for Flexible Server and Azure database for Postgres. Uh, but th these are some customers who use that managed service. Um, anyway, all of the on-demand talks drop at the beginning of the event. And then all of the live stream talks will be made available about a week after the event um, on uh, YouTube and docs.microsoft.com. Awesome. So, cool. Yeah. Well, Claire, it seems like there's a lot going on in this space. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of events and a lot of sessions to check out during the event. There's no need to register, which is pretty nice. So just follow along CitusCon, mark your calendar. Uh, and thanks so much for coming on and sharing with us a little bit about Citus. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. And yeah, please, it's a first time event, so we can use all the help we can get. Uh, spreading the word. So um, if any of you are on Twitter, um, please follow CitusCon on Twitter. Um, and, you know, you can retweet from there and help make more people aware of it um, because these speakers have put together some great materials and I'd love for you all to see them. Awesome. Thanks so much, Claire. Uh, in the news update, we'll also share info and all the links to all this great content. Uh, awesome. Thanks again, Claire. Thanks, Anna. Awesome. Oh yeah, there's the blog post. Uh, so if you uh, if you missed anything or you want to get all the details related to CitusCon, go ahead and head over to the blog post. Uh, I put all the references that Claire talked about so you can learn more about Citus, Postgres, as well as CitusCon. All right, so we're going to move right along. Uh, those of you that have been here before know the next thing we do is we talk about all the blogs and videos. And uh, let me be the first to tell you, if you don't know already, there are a lot of them. Uh, so let's start by taking a look at the videos that we launched on Data Exposed. So as you all know, we do have a show called Data Exposed in addition to this live show. Uh, this is our YouTube channel where you can find all the shows, whether it's live or pre-recorded or special events or series or MVP edition. There's a lot going on always in this space. I wanted to tell you about a couple of new episodes that landed this month. Uh, we did an awesome episode with the Hasura team on GraphQL. So if you're interested in using GraphQL with Azure SQL or SQL Server, that's a great one. Uh, we also, for our MVP edition, we had on uh, Tim Radney, who told us all about Azure VM sizing when you move from SQL Server on-prem to SQL Server and Azure VM. This one was really insightful. It's been really popular, so you want to check it out. Another exciting and popular one was this SQL 911 about a DBA's guidebook. Uh, this is from a member of our uh, field community who's essentially worked with the product group, with customers over the past, uh, I think over a year or two years, uh, and built a book of notebooks that you can use to kind of understand what's going on in your uh, SQL Server environment using Azure Data Studio and the notebooks capabilities. Really awesome video, and he's working on expanding it to Azure SQL as well, so something to check out. Um, then we had uh, Noel and some of the other PMs from the Azure Data Factory team come on to tell us about everything new in Azure Data Factory. Uh, they came on, come on every once in a while to Data Exposed to let us know what's going on. It's always a lot of cool and exciting stuff. Um, and then you can see even beyond the past month, we have a lot of episodes related to SQL Server 2022, um, Azure Data Studio, all sorts of topics we're covering on Data Exposed. And when it comes to live shows, uh, this year we kind of scaled back a little. We were doing a lot of live shows. Now we're trying just to do the news updates show. So you can see some of the news updates that we've had in the past. A couple of popular ones include the news update year in review, as well as SQL Server 2022 Live. This one's with Bob Ward and a bunch of other folks, and we dive into SQL Server 2022. All right, so that's our show, what we've been doing. And you can head to aka.ms slash Azure SQL YT uh, to kind of follow along and subscribe to our channel. And the next thing we'll do is we'll go through some of the blogs. Now, I just wanted to go through a selection of these blogs uh, from the Azure blog. 
And the first one I wanted to show you was related to Azure Data Health Services or Azure Health Data Services. This is something we recently launched and might not be directly related to databases, uh, but I think it's very related to anyone working with databases or data in the health space. Uh, this is a really awesome service or set of services that we've put together. And one of the big things that include that is included here is the Azure API for FHIR or FHIR. Um, and if you're working in the health space, you're probably very familiar with this. And um, it's interesting to see how we're kind of adapting and molding and trying to help folks in this industry, especially with uh, personal health information and making sure that's secure, compliant, uh, but also you get all the things that you need with database like performance, availability, and reliability, and security. Um, so that's something I would recommend checking out. Um, there's a couple blogs actually related to this, how you can also migrate your data to Azure Health Data Services. Um, and then the third blog I wanted to highlight was the Modernize and Migrate Cloud Flexibility, Hybrid Cloud Flexibility event on April 13th. Uh, this is something you might want to check out. Um, essentially, they're going to have some real-life modernization and migration success stories from Azure Fast Track and from our customers. Uh, we're also bringing on some Azure experts like Jeff Holland, uh, Jeff Woolsey, and Bob Ward, our SQL Server and Azure SQL Guru. So that's something to check out because you're going to be getting experts on things like .NET, Windows, and SQL Server and how to uh, migrate or be hybrid. Uh, so that's going to be a good one. There's a couple other reasons to attend. Uh, those are the three that I remembered at this point. Uh, so we're going to move on to the uh, SQL Server tech community and the SQL Server cloud blog. So the SQL Server team has two blogs. Don't ask me why, but it's my job to keep you up to date on what's going on there. Uh, probably the biggest announcement, and hopefully some of you are starting to get uh, waves of this, but end of support for SQL Server 2012 is coming on July 12th this year. So if you're running any 2012s, I know some of you are out there, probably more than you'd like to admit, uh, it's time to think about what you're going to do. Uh, you can move towards extended security updates if you need to stay on premises, uh, or you might consider moving to SQL Server and Azure Virtual Machine where you can get free extended security updates for up to three years. We had a lot of people take advantage of this and see with SQL Server 2008. Um, and I'm anticipating a lot of people want to take advantage of this free extended security updates, which can save you about 70% uh, than if you go towards extended security updates on premises, or you can upgrade and figure out how to get to SQL Server 2019 and hopefully SQL Server 2022 sometime in the future. All right, uh, so that was kind of the big announcement from here. There are a couple other uh, announcements here that you can see. Uh, one is the, um, the new, uh, Microsoft Data SQL Client 5.0 Preview 1. Uh, basically, this team, you see a lot of these updates throughout the year. They try to provide two GAs every year uh, and then two or three preview releases in between that time. So that gives them time to get feedback and all that sorts of things. Uh, the biggest updates that I noticed, uh, you can see all of them in the blog, but the big, biggest updates I saw was the SQL data source enumerator. And this allows you to have a mechanism to essentially enumerate all the available instances of SQL Server within the local network that you're running. Uh, so it's pretty interesting. Also some things around attestation and thread safety issues. Uh, that you want to check out. Uh, then finally, for SQL Server, the SQL Best Practices Assessment for SQL Server on Azure Virtual Machines did go GA. I got to announce this at SQL Bits. It was super exciting. Um, I wanted to show you all just a very quick demo of this. Uh, so here I am in the Azure portal. Uh, and once I enable SQL assessments on my SQL Virtual Machine, I'm going to see options of you know, you can see when it was run in the past, when it's scheduled, and I can also start to take a look at the results for a specific run. So I can see things like the total number of issues, I can see the category of those issues, and you can see I have a bunch of filters to filter on things that might be more relevant to me. Um, then just going quickly on the left hand side, these are all the different issues. And if I select a specific issue, I can see all of the databases that might be affected by that. Uh, just to take a look at one, I have this TimTB performance one, which says uh, I need to have more data files added to TimTB. So you can see the explanation, you can see more information, you can see the check that was performed that kind of raised this alert. Um, and so this is a great tool for basically getting those best practices uh, where, where 
from our experts in the uh, SQL Azure portal itself. Sorry. Uh, you can also see trends. So if you have this run multiple times or on a schedule, you can see how your uh, how your alerts change as you kind of uh, address these SQL assessment results. So that's something uh, to keep in mind as well. Um, that's really all I had for the demo. Um, moving right along to the Azure SQL tech community. A uh, lot of things happening in this space. I want to take a little time and show you all. Um, I also want to take a second to highlight some of the comments we've been getting. Elbow bump. Thanks. I'll take it. Hello, everyone is very talented. Thank you. Um, and then from John Askew, we are getting Azure SQL news is always great. It's great to have you joining us here live as well. All right. So let's talk about some of the things that happen in the Azure SQL tech community. Remember, I said you will find announcements, smaller announcements that actually land here and not in our overall product updates. Uh, the first is online database move and copy for SQL managed instance. This entered private preview. Uh, that essentially means that it's it's a gated preview. So if you want to get involved and you're interested in this, uh, head over to that blog and then you'll be able to kind of sign up or request to sign up for the private preview. Uh, another exciting one I wanted to share is a new way to troubleshoot out of memory errors. Uh, and Dimitri wrote this and Dimitri has been working on this. Uh, so it's really awesome. You're going to want to read the blog, but I'm going to try to give the uh, quick overview of what this new update actually entails. So uh, so essentially, this is a way to troubleshoot out of memory errors in the database engine. So what Dimitri does is he triggers an out of memory error so that you can kind of go through the troubleshooting process. I took screenshots from his blog. I will be very honest about that. So if you take a look, what this is the the uh, out of memory error you might get. Um, but what we added uh, is this new DMV that allows you to kind of query the out of memory events. And in there, you can see some different information like uh, the out of memory cause description is that there was low memory. Um, and we can see some other things related to the top memory clerk. So if we expand this out, we're actually getting details about the memory clerks and uh, the amount of pain that that's causing. Uh, so for example, in this one, we're seeing the top memory clerk is cache store PHDR, uh, which has about one gig of memory allocated. Uh, and this is just a basic database, which only has two gigs of memory or maybe even less allocated. And if you read about what this memory clerk means, it says this cache store is used for temporary memory caching during parsing views, constraints, and defaults. Uh, and once the query is parsed, the memory should be released. Now, the query that Dimitri executed to get this result was actually a really large. Uh, so it consisted of thousands of repeated statements combined into one statement using a union clause. So this required more memory for parsing that was basically allowed in this basic database, which then caused the out of memory error that we saw. Now, the other piece of insight that this new DMV gives you is this top resource pool. So you can see here we're seeing uh, slow shared pool one. And for Azure SQL database, this is the pool used for user workload. So this is what you would expect to see. Um, for Azure SQL Managed Instance and for SQL Server, uh, the top resource one pool you would expect to see is the default one. So just something to keep in mind. But if you see something else here, that might be an indication, a further indication of something else that's going on. So now you might be wondering, OK, this is great, but what if the out of memory condition is so impactful that it causes the database engine to terminate. How are you going to get these results? Uh, so what also came with this was a new extended event uh, that was introduced with this DMV. And this is essentially going to allow you uh, to persist the data, data to a file on file target on disk or in Azure Blob Storage if you're running in Azure SQL uh, to avoid losing this key information in the case of an engine crash. Uh, so this is all great. Uh, you probably want to read more of the details in the blog, uh, but it was pretty exciting, so I thought I'd try to share with you. Moving right along, uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, we recently announced the uh, public preview capabilities to migrate at scale using the Azure SQL migration extension. And this doesn't just include the migration extension in Azure Data Studio, but it also includes uh, the ability to do a couple things here uh, using PowerShell. So Azure Data Studio is great when you're just doing like one or two migrations, but if you want to go at scale 
uh, then using things like PowerShell or Azure CLI is going to be super helpful. Uh, moving right along, there were a couple more blogs uh, that you might want to check out. One I wanted to highlight was a previous announcement, and this was the change in the database restore progress. So what you're seeing now is what used to be the percent complete. So basically you had zero, 50, and 100. There's nothing in between. So this new update is, um, is simple, but it's actually going to be really helpful so you have an idea, a better idea of how complete that database restore actually is, how the progress is going, and some idea of when it might complete. Because now we can go between 0 and 100 as opposed to just 0, 50, and 100, which is not as useful. All right, the, uh, the last thing I, actually, I think the second to last thing I wanted to highlight is that uh, you can now do import export using private link now in preview for Azure SQL database. And this is really interesting because they've essentially set up a service managed private endpoint for the storage account, which is going to allow you to kind of go between SQL Server and the storage account uh, all using private endpoints. Lots more information in the blog on that one, so you want to check that out, as well as uh, this, this top blog mentioned here is about that service broker and hybrid messaging exchange with SQL Server and Azure SQL Managed Instance. Uh, two more things. Again, there's a lot going on this month. One is the uh, GA of Azure SQL maintenance windows for SQL database and Azure SQL managed instance. This allows you to essentially say when you want the maintenance on your database to take place, as opposed to it just taking place whenever it happens. You can now say, hey, I want it to take place on, on these times because that's when my workload is lower. And the other thing that's really exciting that I wanted to just highlight is data virtualization with Azure SQL managed instance. So this is essentially kind of the start of bringing that poly-based capabilities to Azure SQL Managed Instance over uh, Azure Data Lake storage. Uh, so this is going to allow you to do things like query many, many parquet files at once. Um, moving right along to the Azure SQL Dev Corner, uh, there were two blogs this month. So again, this blog is really focused around developing apps with Azure SQL Database. Uh, there was one blog about GraphQL with Hasura. You might also remember there was also a Data Exposed episode on this topic. Uh, so you can kind of use both of those together to learn more about GraphQL, Hasura, and using all those things with Azure SQL Database. And then there was also a really interesting blog about Python, Django, and Azure SQL. Um, and for that, I'm actually going to bring on someone. So you guys have a break um, from me. I'm going to uh, bring up. Abhiman, who is a program manager on the Azure SQL SQL Server team. Um, hey, Abhiman, thanks so much for, for talking to us and coming on the show. Uh, thanks, Anna. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, of course. And you know, I, I know folks are probably very familiar with Django, very familiar with Azure SQL Database, maybe not so familiar with how these two things kind of fit together. Uh, I would love, like, can you tell us a little bit about what's been going on in the Django plus SQL DB space? Uh, yeah, sure. So as we know, uh, Django is a popular web, <coughs> well-liked uh, framework uh, among developers. And we also wanted to add support for it uh, so the developers can take advantage of great capabilities of Azure SQL database and SQL Server, of course. So to demonstrate how things work, uh, I have created a REST API sample in Django using Django REST framework and Azure SQL database. So it's a very simple app uh, which performs CRUD operation. Uh, and I'm using MS SQL um, Django driver to establish connection between Django and Azure SQL database. So to let developers know a bit about the driver, MS SQL Django is a fork of uh, Django MS SQL backend. And the driver provides an enterprise database connectivity option for the Django web framework with the support for Microsoft SQL Server and Azure SQL database as well. So, and this pretty much supports every version of Django, right from 2.2 uh, onwards up to the current uh, 4.x. And our plan is to time our releases to coincide with major releases of Django and SQL Server, of course, or to ensure our customers using this driver can keep up to date 
with the driver and also with the Django while continue to uh, while continue using our uh, Azure SQL and SQL Server databases. So I'll quickly show uh, the demo of the sample app which I have created, and I have already downloaded the code. And yeah, so uh, this is pretty much a <clears throat> sample app Django SQL project, and I have created one API customer API on top of it, and pretty much it's a uh, same code. If you look at here, the model where I have uh, defined uh, the model for my tables, customer, product, order details, and in the view, I have defined uh, all those methods, uh, get, put, post, delete. And uh, the only thing which uh, you need to take care of while, uh, uh, while uh, developing the solution with the Django and Azure SQL in the settings, wherever you define the database configurations, make sure that the engine is targeting to MS SQL and uh, the DB name, uh, DB server, the default port 1433, uh, the username, password, and all these informations are coming from uh, .env file. So I think as a best practice, we should always uh, keep our credentials in a different file, not in the settings, but yeah, you, if you want, you can have it here as well. And if you plan to use uh, Azure SQL DB using managed service identity, uh, the settings would look something like this. So you can put the engine, the, it would be same. Uh, the host, uh, that's uh, your SQL server, the DB, the port number, and this is the extra param which you need to put for or, uh, Active Directory MSI. So just I'll show you the sample ENV file. This is how it looked like. So whatever the key you are passing here, make sure that you are supplying the same in the setting.py. And uh, if I look at the requirement.txt, uh, these are the packages which I'm using. So these packages should be installed to run this sample. So I'll just bring it up my console and let's activate uh, my virtual environment. So I've created a virtual environment, DENV, data exposed DNV and I am going to install those requirement.txt. So all these packages which you see here will be installed. If you wish, you can install them one by one, but it's convenient to install all in one go. So it's being installed. This is pretty cool. So just while it's installing, like this is not just a blog. Like you have actually created a sample that folks can use to get started really easily. Yeah, yeah. So if you look at all these packages, installing uh, PYTZ, PyODBC, uh, TJ Data, all these packages are being installed. Uh, the fact is, uh, this uh, MS SQL Django driver works on top of PyODBC. So this should be installed for this to work. And yeah, it's a fairly pretty simple. Once it is installed, we'll be good to go. Awesome, cool. So once it's installed, then we can just, we're connected, we can run the sample and we can get more guidance on how to get started in the blog. Uh, yep, I think it should be done in a moment. And I guess sometimes this takes a while because it's like going, it's getting all the packages, <laughs> yeah. it's downloading them, it's installing them. Um, what yeah. do we expect to happen like once this completes, then what happens? Uh, just we need to run the uh, Django local server and up, our uh, sample will be up and running. So in the meantime, I'll just take you to the blogs, uh, which I have put together. All those steps are explained here in this blog. Uh, so right from downloading the code to setting up the database to uh, installing all those required packages. If someone wish to install them one by one, they can do so by following these steps. And I have also included steps to deploy the application on a Azure as well. So yeah, uh, I think, yeah, here. So you can deploy your Django app on Azure app service and run it successfully. So let's see if it has been completed. Okay, and this is the repo where we are uh, maintaining our, our driver, MS SQL Django. So if you if you got any suggestion or if you got any issue, 
uh, i'll suggest to head over to our repo file an issue we'll take a look and we'll suggest and yeah here is the sample code if you wish to uh, give it a try you can just download the sample code from here and run it locally so it's, it's a fairly pretty simple uh, i think it's taking <laughs> more time than what i expected uh, let's see <laughs> That's all right. It, it might have just, you know, gotten a little stage fright. Sometimes we have those things happen on Data Exposed. Um, but, you know, Aman, it's been <laughs> great to have you on the show. It's been great to learn about the work going on here. Like we know Django is a very popular uh, framework. Uh, so it's great to see that kind of Microsoft is investing and taking over this MS SQL Django uh, package. Uh, and investing there. So I hope all the viewers will go check this out. Like you said, it's on GitHub. So if you have any issues, uh, folks know what to do. Um, and we'll link to this. We already have this linked in our blog. So you can go take a look at Avon sample, the blog post, and how to even deploy all this to Azure. Um, so Avon, thanks yeah. so much uh, for coming on the show and telling us a little bit about Django and Azure SQL. Uh, thanks, Anna. Thanks. Awesome. Cool. Uh, I actually don't know Django, but I know it's really popular. So maybe it's something I will add to the ever, ever growing list of things that I should be learning. Um, so if you're feeling like there's a lot to learn, you are not alone. I think we all feel that way. Uh, the last set of blogs I wanted to get into before we bring up uh, some more special guests is the Azure Database Support blog. So these are a really interesting set of blogs because uh, these are uh, support engineers or engineers on the Microsoft side of things that work with these really complex, sometimes complex, sometimes not complex issues that customers face. And then they publish these corresponding blogs that kind of show the lessons learned. So uh, there's one series I really like uh, by Jose, and he essentially has this lessons learned series. Uh, some of them are really simple, some of them get really complex. You can see he's all the way up to uh, 194 lessons learned. So uh, sometimes these are really useful. Like if you hit an issue and you're wondering, uh, if this is something the Azure Database support team has seen before, uh, usually a good Bing or Google search that says something like Azure Database support blog, then the name of the issue you're having, you're having at the time uh, will, will bring you here. I also like to read these because it helps me learn about different topics that I might not have otherwise learned about. Uh, now, all that being said, we have our special segment. It's been, we haven't had it in a while, but we're excited to have our special segment, SQL in a Minute. And for that, I'm going to bring on Cheryl and Lexi and pass it to you all. Thanks so much uh, for coming on Data Exposed. Thank you. Thank you. And hey, thanks, Anna. You know, today we have a special treat that we're going to bring to the Data Exposed community. And I'm going to start with a question. What is one of the most essential elements behind all the decisions that we make at Microsoft, from products to design to services? It's research. Research is a tool that we use to help us make decisions to basically better your experience. And what a treat I have today from a member of my own UX design and research team. Lexi, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you for having me, Cheryl. Absolutely. Now let's jump right in. Tell Tell me, how did you get started in research? Yeah, I started in undergrad. I actually joined a decision-making lab as a psychology major at Washington mm -hmm. State University. And I've been hooked ever since. We studied why do people make bad decisions? And mm. why are we taking weird risks sometimes? Right. Um, from there, I continued on into grad school where I learned how to apply that and apply it to product. And right. so after earning my PhD in applied oh, psychology goodness. and decision making, I am, I came to Microsoft. Uh, it was a winding journey, but I made my way here because we can use that science to impact product at scale and really, really quickly. I love how you've kind of intertwined your experience. I like the college drop, always essential for our females in yeah. the community. Um, tell me now, what is the role of research in corporate technology like Microsoft? How is it used? Yeah, um, such a good question. And I, I think it ties back to how you started, Cheryl, of we're, we exist, user researchers exist in corporate tech because we help 
make the the company make good decisions, right? Um, which is where my background comes into. It's a full circle situation, right? We want to make good product decisions and build out the features and tools and resources that people mm -hmm. need to do their jobs and have like delightful experiences with technology. So if technology is not working great, you should go find your user researcher and let them know. Because <laughs> we, we surface those insights and that data right. to the leadership, really who, you know, who, who helped make that decision about, well, what do we work on next? And why do we need to work on that? Nice. I like the prioritization about what's important. And you mentioned something, and I want to dive into that a little bit deeper just yeah. to define it. What actually is the user experience? That's a great question. Yeah, I love that question. And you know the way I define it, Cheryl, because there's lots of shades of, <laughs> of how do we define user experience or UX. Right. And to me, I think the user experience is, is how you and I interact and perceive and use a product, right? And it's how the important part being how, how we see it, right? If it is not delightful <laughs> or it's not doing what we expected or thought right. it would do, right. right? You know, that's my experience and that's right. not a great experience. Right. And so I think that that's really important on, on why those user researchers exist too, right? We're also, a, we're like a translator of, right? <laughs> like people are not enjoying this or, mm -hmm. or like people are telling us they really need this new solution. Right. And, and we help convey that to our stakeholders, like program right. managers, designers, and developers. It sounds like there's a lot of moving parts, but research yeah. is kind of in the middle and being very connective with all those. And speaking about that connectivity, tell me why we need it. Why is it so important? Yeah, I love that because, right, um, you know, we are there to surface this, you know, maybe like this issue. And I can provide an example too, Cheryl. Does that, hmm. is that helpful? Okay. Sure, sure. I'd love to. Um, so one thing that we worked on uh, most recently in the developer relations team was, you know, do we, do we nix the download PDF uh, feature? Right. And so I think that's a great example of, okay, why do we need this in practice? Right. This is what it looks like in practice. Right. Um, we worked with the program management team. Mm -hmm. They reached out and they said, we really want to understand what's going on. We have some data that suggests people aren't really using this tool or this feature, right? The download PF feature. And we want to, before we get rid of this, like we want to do some research to understand, well, what happens if it goes away? What are some solutions that people have or don't even have? And, right. and like, right, we don't have a lot of data to support that it's highly used. So should we just get rid of it? Right. Right. What do we do? So, right. We're in the mix of like, how do we make those decisions and why make certain decisions over others? You know, that particular decision, especially when it comes to Microsoft Docs, was so essential because a lot of our community, they travel, they work offline, um, they use it to study, they're writing notes on it. I definitely remember highlighting Docs that I had printed. And the, the nice part about the being offline is that the PDF captured everything. It captured yeah. how the formatting, you could basically, it's like you were looking at a screen. So I know for me, that was such an essential part of my career traveling through being a engineer and a database administrator and an architect. I definitely used a lot of those materials. Um, the other thing that I thought was essential, and as we continue to talk, that the response from the community and tell me a little bit about, I know that you do your research, but how important is the feedback and the responses that you get for whatever you're working on? Yeah, yeah, I'll continue with this PDF example. And and so important, My I exist because I get to listen. <laughs> I exist in corporate tech because I get to listen to user feedback. And, right, and so what I do is I'll work with a team or maybe I'm on my own if it's an independent project, but really, right, I'm looking at all of that feedback and all of that data and saying, you know, this is right. Exactly what you're saying, Cheryl, of like, this is how people use 
the download PDF feature. And here are the lack of solutions if we take it away. Um, so right, that feedback is critical. And, on, and honest feedback is the best feedback, right? If you're like, right. Oh, I don't want to hurt your feelings. Right. <laughs> but, Absolutely. but really, the feedback is everything. Um, that's why my job is here and our users are really everything, right? So in this PDF, the download PDF example and story, I think the we launched a survey and it had about 5,000 responses. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and people really taking the time to write down and say, no, don't remove the PDF feature. And that was yes. highly valuable, right? Because then we learned the why behind you know, don't do this. And then we also learned like, here's how we learn and use the download PDF feature in context, right? So we learn more about our users through their feedback and through their voice. Right. And so that is why it is so important when people look at our community and they think, oh, this is a big company. No one's really listening to me. But for that particular event, for that decision, when it was mentioned, I think it was back in November, the outpouring of people that were posting on Twitter and all these other places, it was so important to see that connection and to see how you use that as well. Yeah, yes, yeah. Right. And we're so lucky <laughs> right. for the response, right? Because I think it, the the decision was at a point of, of really like, we need, we need to remove this feature because there's a critical bug. Um, so it was very close to being just completely nixed and no other solution being implemented, right? And had we not had that engagement from the community, I think the decision really could have gone that way. Um, but taking the time to sit down and absorb all that user feedback right. and from the community, um, right, really helped everyone on the team and project understand, like, we have to have this. <laughs> And we will work on solutions to fix the bug, right? Like, let's focus on the bug <laughs> and go for right. it. So I, and I can continue to talk about this for hours, but I know we don't have that time. I would love to have you come back and kind of mm -hmm. talk more about and illustrate how research plays a part in, in all of these services and products that we provide. But I want to thank you so much for coming. I'm hoping that the design community sees this as well, because we're here and we're connected to the one Microsoft. So thank you so much for coming today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Okay. Yeah, and likewise, thanks so much, Cheryl and Lexi. It's so interesting to learn about this whole other side of what's going on that a lot of people yeah. don't even um, think about. So thanks so much. And yeah, we'll look forward to having you on the show again. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. Okay. And one thing I wanted to highlight from this team, uh, or just in general, if you feel like having feedback about the documentation or anything related to it, uh, there's lots of ways you can uh, do that. Uh, you can email, you can be a contributor, you can uh, file issues on GitHub. Uh, so definitely, uh, definitely keep engaging because as you can tell, uh, we can hear, we are listening, we are watching, uh, not in a weird way, but in a way that we want to learn uh, and give you all uh, what you want to see. Uh, next, we're going to bring up Marisa uh, to tell us about upcoming events. Hey, Marisa. Hey, Anna. Thanks for having me on. Of course. What's going on coming up? <laughs> we have a lot going on, and I thought I'd give you kind of the scope of what's going on this spring. Um, you'll see there are actually some in-person events, so that is a thing again, and we are traveling, and this week we have about 15 speakers in Las Vegas at the SQL Server and Azure SQL Conference. And they're, I think they're actually doing the keynote right now, but there's a keynote, there's uh, pre-cons, about 20 sessions, they're doing a panel, they're doing a volunteer event. So we are actively involved and we are back at it. Uh, following, we have a couple partner conferences. So we will be with Dell Technologies on May 2nd and Intel Vision on um, May 10th. May 24th through 26th is Microsoft's Build. So that is a conference that we hold for software developers and web developers and kind of talks about all of our latest and greatest going on. Our Azure SQL SQL Server team will be there for a round table and a few sessions. And we're hoping to get uh, totally involved with that conference. On June 6th through 8th, we have another partner event that's with Pure Storage. Um, and then in June, we're traveling to Austin, Texas, and that is for Visual Studio Live. We have a few speakers going there, again, to get pre-cons and sessions, and we're trying to 
uh, target that developer audience. June 28th through 30th, we will be at HPE Discover, so another kind of partner event. So lots going on this spring. Um, in addition, we always have our episodes of Data Exposed every Thursday where you get to hear about the new content that's coming out and some of which is in these conferences. But if you cannot go to the conferences, uh, that's another great way to get new information from us. And that is all. Thanks, Anna. Awesome. Thanks so much, Marisa. There's always a lot going on uh, in person and virtual. I love this new world we're in. <laughs> yeah, us too. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much. All right, okay, so as we wrap up the show, if you're new to this show, you know that I always do a learn module, so Microsoft learn module that I recommend for the month, as well as my pick of the month. Uh, now this month, I'm actually highlighting a whole learning path. I know that kind of isn't a module, but uh, it's a series of modules, there's like four modules. Uh, and I've highlighted some of the individual modules before, but this time I wanna highlight the whole learning path, build serverless, full stack applications in Azure. Uh, this is something that I built with Davide, uh, I guess over a year ago now. Uh, but Avamon actually was on the show earlier, has helped us in revamping this. So recently, the, we have updated it to include the la latest versions of the Azure SQL and Azure Static Web Apps GitHub Actions. Uh, we simplified the code, which probably uh, is good for everyone. And we upgraded the .NET uh, version. Remember, it was .NET, Python, and uh, node.js. Uh, but we updated the .NET code from 3.1 to 6.0. So something else to check out. Um, looks like we did get a question. Uh, when should I use Azure SQL versus Desmos? I'm not sure what Desmos is, Casper. So if you want to clarify, I'll take another stab at it. Um, and yeah, it's a module of modules. It's a lot of a lot of things going on for sure. Uh, but you can catch that at that short link, Azure Modern Apps, uh, that's there. And then I, for my pick of the month, uh, I had to pick this. Like it was just so obvious that this was going to be the selection for the month. Uh, some of you uh, tuning in might have already seen this, and maybe you were in in person at the SQL Bits keynote back at the beginning of March. Uh, but this was just like a hilarious keynote. Uh, I am so uh, happy and excited to even have been a part of it. But essentially in this keynote, to give you like a high level synopsis, we're in Bob Ward's dream and Buck Woody is also in Bob Ward's dream. And Bob is basically trying to figure out what he's going to do for the keynote. Uh, it all takes place in like an arcade. Uh, there's a lot of guests that come in and out. So like here, I pulled it up. Uh... Oops. Here, uh, so I pulled it up, and you can see like it's it's been pretty popular. The speakers that are in it are also include Pedro, who does an awesome performance demo with SQL Server 2022, uh, Evangeline White, who does an awesome demo with Purview, and it's also just really funny the whole interactions with Bob and Buck. Uh, and Patrick LeBlanc also has a great Power BI demo with live refresh and Adam Saxon is in it, like beating him at a game of Pac-Man. Just really entertaining. Uh, even Marisa's at the beginning of it as a worker in this arcade. Uh, it was a whole production. Like even if you aren't an Azure SQL and SQL Server fan, uh, I still think you're gonna enjoy watching this. So that's my pick of the month. Uh, if you want to view it, I created this short URL so you can get to it pretty easily, aka.ms slash SQL bits keynote. 2022. Um, so definitely uh, check that out. Have a good laugh. Uh, let us know what you think. Leave a comment. Uh, leave a comment on this video. Send me a ping on Twitter. I uh, would love to know uh, what you all think of this and if you think it was worthy as a pick of a month. Uh, that about wraps the show. Uh, what I wanted to do, show you one more time. Just remember, we cover a lot of things during the show, if you go to aka.ms slash news updates, that's where you can find the blog that has everything. This goes live at the same time uh, we go live. So I can show you one more time here. Um, you can see this blog again, it goes live when we go live right at 9 a.m. And you can get all the product updates, the other database updates, all the videos, the blogs, all the events. Uh, the Microsoft Learn module, my pick of the month. So you can also get a link to the um, 
the blog there as well. Um, it's always great to, to come on Data Exposed and share all the news with you. If you ever have any feedback or insights or things you want to see or things you don't want to see, feel free to leave us a comment, like this video, follow us on Twitter at Azure SQL. Um, and we hope to see you next time on Data Exposed. Thank you.